Hey, my name is Taylor Paschal. I'm a knowledge management lead with Blink Health Pharmaceuticals, and I'm going to be your moderator for the day. So before we start this particular presentation, just want to share between 11 and 5 today, this track is going to be about all things uh, knowledge sharing. We're going to hear from KM practitioners. Uh, they're going to be sharing their experiences, their learnings, their practices, and their strategies for enabling successful KM programs. So you can head in and out for each of these sessions. You can switch tracks if you choose, but I'll be here all day today till 5 if you'd like to join me. So we're going to be starting today with transforming decision making with information architecture and LLMs. And we are we have the pleasure of hearing from Seth Early, CEO of Early Information Science, and Giovanni Piazza, former head of KM Services at Takeda. So give, help them give a warm welcome. And we're going to have a great presentation. Thank you very much, everybody. I'm, I'm, I'm the former a lot of things. Um, because I've been involved in knowledge management since virtually the inception of the discipline in the early 90s. And uh, I spent my entire working life <clears throat> fighting against people who told me, now that we have X, we don't need to do the work anymore. Do you remember? Give everybody a cool website uh, and we won't need uh, content management anymore. Why don't we give everybody a blog? That will solve our knowledge sharing problem. Okay, everybody blogging, etc. And then there was uh, oh, oh oh social network, the the, the, the enterprise. Uh, uh, what is it called now? I don't want to say it, but you know Yammer, and everybody's going to instant message, and all our pro knowledge problems will be solved. And now artificial intelligence. Guess what? It never worked. It never worked because uh, all these things augment the power of the work. They don't replace the need for the work. So I see a lot of nodding here, which basically means that I'm preaching to the choir, and so let's uh, move on. Um, so <clears throat> what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about doing the work and doing the work in the 21st century, using everything that the discipline, knowledge management, gave us, plus artificial intelligence. Not to replace the need to do the work, but to help us do the work. So I was working for a company that will remain unnamed because now I'm a former, and so they threatened me with terrible things if I say what company that was, because I'm not authorized to talk about it anymore. And uh, I looked at my retirement papers, and declining my First Amendment rights wasn't there, so I decided to come here and, and still talk about what I did. But basically, I was working for a company that moves uh, in an industry where it takes uh, 10 years to go from an idea to a production product. 10 years, usually $10 billion, and the failure rate is 99%. So you can imagine that if you work for a company like that, and if you are an executive in a company like that, what you want to look at more, more than anything else is your portfolio. So all the things that are in the pipeline, all the things that are anywhere in those 10 years and $10 billion, and make sure that if you need to kill them, you kill them at the right time. And if you need to boost the spending, you do it at the right time. And if you need to do something, you do it at the right time. So there was uh, this pyramid of project managers, each and every one of whom was responsible for a specific project in the pipeline. And they were quarterly reporting about their status or asking the powers that be to help them usually with more money, sometimes with more time, sometimes with, uh, uh, to approve a change of direction. So this is, this is not small potatoes. We're talking about a mission critical event, a mission critical uh, kind of uh, pyramid and communication and guess what? Knowledge exchange. I know everything about this project. I need some direction from some, or, or some guidance or some money from somebody who has the big picture, and we need to communicate and we need to share. This was the process. If it looks like a mess, it is because it was a mess. 
you see, when you see all, all, all these little people there, they had, they had, imagine this, they had three FTEs. No one, not two, three FTEs. Three FTEs means in the neighborhood of 6,000 work hours a year. Just to manage this, with the, the project managers sending emails, this ops is the operation team, the 6,000 man hours, uh, sorry, work hours, that were packaging things, putting them on local drives, and then moving them. These were all physical copies. And you're all knowledge managers. You know that when you make a physical copy of a knowledge artifact, it never ends well. Never. So those were all physical copies. And uh, there were several times, uh, several kinds of artifacts. There were narratives. So w w what am I asking for? The presentation, which is nothing but the narrative in a good, nice PowerPoint format. The minutes of the meetings where decisions were made. And memos that basically repeated pieces of the minutes. So there was uh, a ton of work in terms of also streamlining the content architecture here. And then obviously, what happens here? Another physical copy for each one of the executives. And I don't, I don't know if I told you, but you're all knowledge managers, so you know that when you make physical copies of something, <laughs> it never ends well. Did I just make a physical copy of something that I said a minute ago? But uh, never mind. So one day, I'm there in my office, and I got mail. It was my boss's boss writing me an email saying that her boss complained that, guess what? We're all knowledge managers here, right? Well, you are all knowledge managers. I'm a retired knowledge manager. I'm a former knowledge manager. Guess what? Yeah. Guess what? I can't find anything in this organization. You've never heard this, right? You've never heard this. An executive that comes to you and says, I can't find anything in this organization. So, oh, and by the way, that email ended with, don't reply to this email. <laughs> so my boss's boss writes me about a complaint that her boss was making and said, don't reply to this email. Come and see me when you have a solution. So <laughs> now you understand why when I said I'm a former something, I smile so widely, right? <laughs> so so what, did, what did I do? I said, OK. Let's sketch out the solution. The four elements of the solution are consolidate the content. Guess what? Content is king. Content is king. Content is king. The first thing that we're going to do is streamline the content. And I don't want to go back to the spaghetti here. <laughs> but imagine, just in terms of content consolidation, once, you, once you, you fix this aspect of the mess, you're already halfway home. OK, so then create a content management system so that uh, we don't uh, use 6,000 work hours a year to maintain the body of content that 25 senior executives use. Just, just the, the staggering absurdity of these numbers, 6,000 work hours to, create, to manage the content base that 25 people use. So the second thing, develop a UI, develop a good experience. We'll get back to this uh, design from the experience backwards because that created some, some interesting things. <laughs> OK. And, uh, and find a story to tell. What is the story? The story to tell is the calendar. So create an experience whereby people can go in there, those 25 people, high level senior executives, executives go there and say, OK, what day is it? What do I need to do? Who's asking for what? That was the story. The story is a calendar-based system. So these four things, keep them in mind, because that's where we're going to go. So we got to this point. You go, oh, by the way, notice the absence of a scroll bar. Notice the absence of a scroll bar. Because uh, 
This is a long, strongly held belief of mine. If you need to scroll, you've blown it. Okay? Calendar. You go to this day. What day is it? Today. Okay, what do we have here? Minutes of the meetings. Agendas for the next meeting. Here are the next to-dos. You know those executives whose uh, attention, patience and attention for detail are inversely proportional. Right? They have no patience and they want the answer now. I haven't even asked the question, but I want the answer. Okay? So that is, uh, and uh, um, so then obviously, obviously, obviously there are 25 people and 27 access control the different lists. Because you can see this, but not that, but only on Tuesdays. And you know, I can let you have a look at the uh, abstract, but not the entire text. Uh, wrong, wrong, wrong. But there are just so many battles that I can fight, uh, or that I could fight when I wasn't a former or anything. OK. And so I said, OK, you want your access control? I'll give you your access control. Always remember, knowledge shared is knowledge gained. And we're all working for the same company, so there is no reason to segregate the content. But that's a battle for another day. So obviously, there was a search, because you can provide everything you want, or the calendar view, the, the prioritized list of the decision log, the resources, et cetera. But somebody's always got to go a search. So there was a search bar. And uh, um, again, provide access not only to knowledge created, but also to the enablers to create knowledge. As part of, remember the four points, as part of the content rationalization, we rationalize the templates. So you want to talk about X, use this. You want to talk about Y, use this. Um, there was some change management needed to convince people that uh, using a standard template was better than using what they were used to until yesterday. But we managed to, to succeed because one of, the, one, of the, uh, one of the people who were part of the operations office, so 2,600, 6,000 uh, work hours, uh, the lady was German. German. So when it came to enforcing some discipline, I just took a step back and I said, you do you. <laughs> so it, it, it worked just fine. It worked just fine. Um, oh, and then, and then, and then something that I can say now that I'm a former something, I couldn't say before, segment things. So just spoon feed the executives. So this is basically the workflow, uh, the portfolio entry, so the project. Where are we at? The, I can't tell you what industry that was, but it was an early development. OK, so how are we doing? We are in the first and second of these 10 years, the first and second of these billion dollars. How are we doing? And what's the result? And what happens afterwards? So by clicking here, the executives, those 25 people, would jump straight into what they were interested in. So again, again, develop the story. What was the story? The story was the calendar. Everything was time-based because that's how they think. Where are we at in the process? It's not the ultimate story. If I were to develop another tool for another situation, I would probably find, but the most, important, the most important thing was content. The second most important thing is, how do we tell the story in a way that is compelling? Um, then we have, obviously, links to the documents instead of having, I'm not going to go back to the old workflow, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, and then, again, executives, they don't have much time. They don't have much. They're not willing to pay much attention. They want the way they want. They want, they want what they want, and they want it now. So what is the ask? So remember, remember the experience. I'm an executive. Go in, 
the store in front of me is time-based, if I know that I want to, what do they want? I go straight to the ask. If I want to know what am I supposed to do today, I go to the calendar. If, I want, if my question is, what did we just decide? I have the decisions. So, uh, did I tell everybody? I have the memos and no scroll bar. So that, that's how the story came about. And again, that's the other thing. Componentize. Chunk up things. Because, OK, yeah, you ask me, yeah, sure, it is a 157-page uh, PDF file. Everything is in here. Well, I would have been a former something a long time ago if, I, if, if that were the solution. Because people want, they want to be able to zero in in what they need. And I just said it. I just said it. Do I want the memo? Do I want this? Do I want that? Do I want that? So that was, the, um, that was the idea. We need to uh, remedy the mess. And again, see, decision and action items. I walk you through basically the basic components of that tool. How did we go about it? Well, I did what I always do when, when my boss's boss writes me an email that ends with, do not reply with this email. I called Seth. I called him and said, Seth, I need help. But I also did something that Seth didn't very much like, and, and we'll talk about this later. I also hired and I engaged with a, a with a, with, a, with a firm that was specialized in designing user interfaces. And so I'm going to give you this little tidbit, and we will pick it up later. I am a strong, I don't particularly think that agile is a good methodology to develop enterprise applications versus commercial products. But I strongly believe that a, a experience-based design is the way to go. You start from the experience. Just show the experience. Don't write a requirement document. I hate the idea of requirement documents. OK? Just show the experience. And when they start nodding, that is when they say, OK, how do we make that happen? Which is an interesting way of developing things for reasons that we will see later on. But OK, so that was what we did. That was how we did it. And now Seth. Uh, will tell you the real story. So, so one of the things that uh, Giovanni mentioned is that uh, a user experience company was hired to build the UI before we were able to um, build the IA, right? And a lot of times uh, that, that does not necessarily lead to the best result because it's very easy to design something that is perfect and make promises that everybody's going to be able to get everything they need when they need it. And that expectation was a very difficult expectation to fulfill sometimes because you don't know where the data is and you don't know how the data is structured. So if you don't have the source of data, a beautiful UI is not going to help you. And so that meant we had to work backwards from that. And again, you know, the usual stuff that you do with these types of things User stories and use cases, very, very important, right? What is, and, and what's interesting is the UI company did not build use cases, okay? They just built pretty pictures, and then every time we went into them and annotated and said, well, what goes behind here? Well, we haven't designed that. What goes behind here? We haven't designed that. Where does this come from? We don't know. That's your job. <laughs> so a lot of this was, was challenging because we did not have many of those pieces that we would normally build when we're doing UI work. Of course, we had to do model the domain. You know, what are the entities? What are the big buckets? What are the organizing principles? We built what we call a high fidelity journey map, which is understanding the user's intent in metadata terms, right? Because they, you know, a, a user a journey is great. A user journey map is lots of insights, but your systems can't respond to them. They can respond to signals from the user that are in the form of data or metadata. Uh, of course, understanding the content. Looking at the current state of the taxonomy, there were taxonomies, I'll put it that way. <laughs> um, you guys know what I'm talking about. Uh, they also had lots of ontologies, and there were interesting ways of looking at ontologies, and I won't get into that, but 
I think it was made it a little more complicated and difficult to leverage the ontologies. And of course, we wanted to have metrics. What are we going to impact? And we also needed to do all of the tech stack. We had to do the we, we did We built everything from the beginning when we were given a pretty picture. And again, this is kind of a design methodology around uh, information architecture. Where are you today? Where do you want to go? What's the difference between here and there? And then how well are you doing things today? Right? Do you have any good practices? Because if you have really bad practices, but you don't have far to go, that's still a big change. right? But if you're doing some things well today, and even if you have something very ambitious, it may not be as much of an effort, because you already have the good practices in place. So, so that becomes a, str a strategy and roadmap. And then you want to start looking at content, audiences, tasks. What are they doing? Who's doing it? What are they doing? And that's where you're building a requirements uh, document. So that's the next phase of additional granularity. And then we have the architecture, right? How are we going to build the content uh, model, the metadata? Everybody here is familiar with content models, yes? Anybody not? Anybody refuse to vote? Most of you, OK. Um, so and, and use cases, but how are people going to be uh, not only authoring uh, so task analysis is one thing, but use case is really on the authoring side and the, and the content lifecycle side. After you have all of this, you really have blueprints to build the thing. And again, usually you start with, well, let's look at the whole thing. Yes, let's start with the user experience, but let's also stay well connected and collaborate about the whole um, data uh, part of this, about how we're going to get the data and where we're going to get the data from. Um, so in any case, we, uh, then you need to think about testing and testing lots of different things. You can test taxonomies separately from a user interface. You can test a user interface separately from the taxonomies because a, uh, a, a good taxonomy will be ruined by a bad user interface and vice versa. So we have to look at that. And we also need to think about how are we going to tag this content? Are we going to use manual processes, human review, machine-aided? Are we going to do auto categorization? And that becomes your test plan that really says, let's validate this stuff as we go in multiple ways. And then finally, you have this piece, which is governance and, stra and, and, and uh, governance strategy, guidelines, metrics, socialization, migration, metric, all of these things. But these are not started at the end. These are actually started at the beginning when you're doing current state. You have to say, who on your, when you're interviewing executives, who on your team should, should have a seat, we want you to have a seat at the table. Who should represent your interests? There's a lot of things, people don't like governance, they don't like the idea of governance. If you say there's a governance meeting and you ask them when they can meet, they'll say, uh, let's see, how about never? <laughs> I have never available, does never work for you? So you have to be able to say, this is about metrics decision, uh, driven decision making, and yes, your presence is there because you've been designated as the person. So in any case, um, you know, then we start to thinking about the knowledge graph and the foundational information architecture. The knowledge graph is really dependent upon taxonomies and ontologies, and, and ontologies are dependent upon uh, <coughs> taxonomies and thesaurus structures. So they're not separate things. Some people present them as separate things. They're not separate things. You begin with taxonomies and entities, and then you relate them to other entities. Here are my products, here are my services, here is my um, uh, services for this product. Or here is a uh, biochemical pathway and a, and a drug target. Here's the uh, drug target uh, for this biochemical pathway, right? Those are conceptual relationships. And again, when we start with the, the information architecture, it starts with the business problem. And then we have lots of places where we're, we're course correcting. And it's, it's really not possible to fail if you do it this way. There's a lot of obstacles that are now being uh, handled by things like, my water here, by things like, um, large language models that allow you to do things much more efficiently and much more quickly. Like a, a project that would have cost a million dollars 10 years ago could be done for $100,000 today. You know, we have tools, we have models, we have algorithms that do things like help you derive the taxonomies and ontologies and the entity models and the domain models and then help you tag and uh, auto-classify, componentize. All of these things are now facilitated by large language models. So we build you know, a reference architecture, and the reference architecture is really to power all of the applications that you begin to build when you are doing things like replatforming or when you're building something new. You don't want to 
let, leave everyone to their own devices. You want to have that ontology, which is the soul of the business, which is what my book is about. It's about the AI-powered enterprise, but it's really about information architecture. There's no AI without IA. That was a, a craze I coined years ago. No artificial intelligence without information architecture. Wrote that in 2016, and so I'm just killing time while people are taking pictures. In 2016, <laughs> when uh, uh, I wrote that article and coined that phrase, uh, someone just reposted that recently to LinkedIn saying, this is more important today than it was in 2016. So the same article uh, was very prescient. But again, you get the idea here that you're trying to leverage all of these organizing principles across these different systems and platforms. And you can't have internal acts of heroics and expect a good customer experience, right? So we have to look at, the, uh, at, at uh, making workplace uh, tools easier to use, collaboration tools easier to use. So, you know, we start with requirements and build the architecture, design, um, uh, build the, the uh, components. We test those. Um, we function test them. We integration test them. We acceptance test them and so on. And all of these things are validation points, right? So we're, we're decomposing the problem and then we're assembling it together by solving specific problems. There's a whole bunch of other stuff. I taught a three-hour workshop yesterday on this. But, um, you know, IA is the core to everything. IA is the core to, uh, to retrieval augmented generation because that is a retrieval. That is a search problem. And people don't realize that. So you really do have to start with the IA because it will uh, not work when you have garbage in, garbage out, right? So it still doesn't give you a free lunch. Everybody wants a free lunch. Every executive says, let the AI take care of it. And you guys know <coughs> that's not how it works. By the way, I have a Harvard Business Research Analytics uh, Services uh, research report where I was interviewed about how to get the most from Gen AI. I'll give you an opportunity to contact me at the end of the deck and I can, I can send that article because it really, really lays it out and it's from a very good source. Uh, very credible source. So um, we, uh, the, the company not to be named, which we will call ABC Company, how creative that is, um, engaged with another company to design the UI before we were looking at the data. Not a bad idea, but it required a lot of collaboration, and that didn't necessarily happen. So the data and content were, were fragmented, they were stored in different locations. Duplicated manual. Oh, you saw the thing that Giovanni uh, showed you. That's just a sentence trying to describe the big giant mess. Did you want to add to that, Giovanni? Uh, yeah. Um, it was my job to get the people in charge of the foundation and the people in charge of the pretty picture <laughs> to see eye to eye and uh, uh, not promise something that could not be delivered and don't design a a system that belongs to the Hall of Fame of information architectures and doesn't make much, much sense to the executives. So my contribution there was uh, the story and then the job of getting these two distinct and complementary professional profiles to come together and deliver a success story. I am convinced that uh, I did a fairly good job, but without <laughs> the people who build the architecture and without the people who can tell the story, uh, I would still be a former something, but not as a smiling former as I am now. <laughs> it was a good capstone project, that's for sure. Uh, and again, we had to meet all these diverse requirements. We had so many different stakeholders. And I think you know the idea of being able to uh, build the front end in, in concert with the back end, there, was, there could have been more collaboration. I mean, they, again, Giovanni did his best to facilitate that, but sometimes it's just the players on the program. And you know, one, at one point, you know, I pointed out that we had to have more than several items on a, on a menu because you, scroll, you would have to not scroll, but you'd have to go through the timeline. And they were insisting that we couldn't have that because of the five to seven item rule. And I said, well, you know, yes, that's a practice, and that's a good point, but the executives want this, <laughs> all right? And this is how you need to do it. So, you know, I got a lot of, well, we're the UI people, so you go take a hike, <laughs> which was not the most collaborative thing. But we worked it out, right? We worked it all out. I mean, it, it's, all of these programs are bumpy. So um, no matter what it is, and no matter what anybody tells you. So again, we had to build the IA and design and implement the back end to provide the pictures 
Uh, use cases, you gotta think about use cases. Lots and lots <coughs> of use cases, hundreds of use cases. I'm a big fan of you building use cases that represent classes of task because there's entities represented in those use cases. I am a role, whatever that is, I need to do a ta an, uh, an action or a task using the following content, right? And that tells you what the entities are. So this was work that wasn't done by the UI firm. Usually when you're doing user experience, you say, how do we know what good looks like, right? And this is how you know what good looks like. They have to be unambiguous, they have to be clearly testable, and so on. So again, we had a lot of different uh, use cases, and again, we had to talk to lots of uh, different people. Uh, we needed to, to make sure they were, they were testable. And when you start looking at the, use ca the uh, UI, we had to annotate them. I had to gray some of this out, but we had to ask all these questions. Where do you get this? <laughs> what happens when you click here? Where does this data come from? And a lot of it ended up necessarily you know, having to be figured out kind of after the fact, right? Because you, really you really do have to think about your data architecture while you're building that user interface, not just throw the design over. And, you know, and then it, we had to do a lot of acts of heroics to make it work. We did it. We, we got it all working. But it, was, it, was, it created a lot of work to do it in such a way because everything had to be annotated. When you get you, wireframes, they should all be annotated. Everything should say where stuff comes from. Uh, and what happens. Again, here's more stuff. It was like, uh, what happens is, you know, here's the organizing theme for the content, uh, calendar and day agenda, memo updates, you know, what a criteria is applied to surface items in this view? Shouldn't there be a date component? You know, you're asking the people who are designing this experience, what's supposed to happen here? What's supposed to happen here, right? And if you just get these, these wireframes, I'm gonna try to give you a minute to take that picture. I know, I hate when people move on when their camera's up, right? You're like, yeah, my camera's up. Don't you see? <laughs> Read the room. <laughs> I want a picture. So again, more of these were just, there, there are issues around uh, top navigation. I had to redact some pieces from this. Resources, uh, you know, wireframes uh, yet to be designed. You know, what, uh, does this point to a, a charter, templates, process document, right? It's all of those questions. And a lot of times you'd have different answers depending upon who you talk to or you would have different expectations from what they asked or what they answered, and then you had to clarify, then disambiguate. Do you want to add to that? No, it's, uh, again, is the creative tension, uh, you know, Schumpeter would have called it the creative disruption, <laughs> between the people, who t the, the people who tell the story and the people who need to make the story happen, mm -hmm. right? And, uh, Again, I keep repeating the same thing. You know, my job as the person who was ultimately responsible for the success of this initiative was to get these two professional profiles, e equally important mm -hmm. professional profiles, come together, we are understand more, we are more each other. We were more important. We were more important. You said equally important. Just humor me. Let's, let's take it. Let's take it. No, if you don't have the data, it's not going to work. <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> Okay, because uh, the, the story needs to be able to be told, otherwise it's a fantasy, right? Right. Am I? Yeah, am absolutely. I, mm? No, no okay. question. So, but the, 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 the one thing, the four things that I started with, content is king, and Seth only talked about content. The coming together of the experience with the uh, practical construction of that. The story. I, the, the one thing I keep repeating. And the scaffolding, mm. the metadata, the information architecture, those are the four things that I started my little mm -hmm. chat about, and uh, you are d dissecting and uh, exposing all four of them. Right, yep. And, and you can see here, this is where we componentize. These are large documents, they're very complex. When Giovanni spoke about ta the tabs, that was componentization, and we did that programmatically, and we could do that at scale. But that's what you need to do for large language models. You need to ingest componentized content. It should be semantically meaningful chunks that answer specific questions. So again, these were the things that, um, uh, that we needed to, to do and to accommodate. Uh, and here's, again, some of the uh, information architecture elements, the taxonomies, the metadata models. We built all of those, so we had to uh, adapt that from the ontology elements. We had uh, an enterprise knowledge graph. Uh, that had to be contextualized. 
uh, the existing taxonomies needed to be normalized, right? It's the th same thing you have, ha that happens everywhere. People work outside of, of a set of standards and, and then uh, it becomes challenging over time because you don't keep it uh, up to date and there's mechanisms for doing that. So all of this provided a consistency of experience and, a, and the ability to improve discovery uh, and a more precise search. The componentization was interesting because we needed to break these things down and we had to use, uh, can, you look at the content versus the process, right? Because they, people weren't doing what they were supposed to do, right? There's a process and there's a structure and there's templates and people were like all over the place. So we ended up having lots of different types of structures that had to be harmonized and integrated and normalized and finding the common denominator. So that was, that was interesting and that was a challenge. Uh, and this is just another example of this. This is, just shows you how varied this content can be and how when you break it up into meaningful chunks, it's gonna take a little bit of, of, of effort. Uh, so again, these were the main components, so we ended up creating a new common uh, template that everyone could use. We also used SharePoint as the back end. That, that application that Giovanni showed you did not look like SharePoint at all, did it? It's not at all, but the SharePoint was the back end, right? So you can build a front end completely different. And, and people say, oh, I don't like SharePoint. Well, no, you don't like the architecture and the experience. You can build anything. Uh, and again, these were the things we used the term store to maintain the taxonomy uh, and so on. And here's where we had to think about uh, security access because one of the problems is right when we actually uh, finished this initiative, they rolled out a pilot, Microsoft a Copilot, and called on a weekend and freaked out because everything was exposed because they let the, the agent loose on everything and bypassed our security. I had to get my developer on, on the Saturday afternoon. I had to go to his house to find him, right? And they said, We're, this is an emergency. It wasn't our problem because it wasn't something we did, but we had to shut it down. Uh, and again, this, this is so sensitive that in some cases, only certain leadership executives are allowed to see certain things. That's how sensitive this stuff was. So we, uh, it was, uh, you know, this is the outcome that you can speak to. I mean, it was very well received, allowed them to navigate, better findability, all the wonderful motherhood and apple pie that comes from good information architecture, security access, and then the componentization allowed us to do the LLM. I know we're running a little bit short on time, so let me try to get through this. But did you want to talk about the results anymore? Uh, no, keep going. Okay. Just so, give me one minute to wrap up okay. at the end, but keep going because okay. this is interesting yep. because I know that this is the question that everybody's asking. What about artificial intelligence? Where right. is artificial intelligence? Here is artificial intelligence. Be patient. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the impact of the metadata, right? Because one of the things our premise is Metadata provides additional signals for uh, when you uh, en enrich, when you embed, when you enrich your embeddings into a vector space, right? A vector space is just describing all of the characteristics of a piece of information in mathematical terms. You're just bolting onto that some explicit metadata that will tell the LLM exactly what you want, right? And, it, and, it, and it's, it's the, you'll see the, the difference, right? Because this was it, right? This was the Portfolio review, highly sensitive, regulated industry, can't have hallucinations, can't expose it to LLMs, um, uh, any shared snippets have to be you know, not retained, uh, and then we wanted to determine, well, does metadata make a difference? Does the IA make a difference? So here are the parameters. You know, we, uh, we scope the IA for that particular content because we built that portfolio application. We componentized the content because they were very large documents. Uh, and then we used a vector store, a local vector store, to maintain privacy in the IP. We used a model with 182 billion parameters, and we had 60 use cases where people, these are the questions that people would ask, that, that the portfolio managers would ask, that the leadership would ask, just natural language questions. And so when we did this, this is what would happen, right? This is the portfolio, this is the componentized content, ingest it into a vector store, uh, and then you, know, you, can, you can interact with it in lots of different ways. But we enriched it with the metadata. We componentized that content. And again, you have the ability to then process it with an LLM and connect to other sources if you want. But this is a very modular approach that we've been building algorithms around where we have lots of reusable pieces. So we have software accelerators that help do this stuff at scale. Um, so this was just some of the answers. Right? It said, uh, sometimes it pulled from the metadata. Sometimes it pulled from the content. So what was the ask of, to ABC in early clinical development? And it tells, tells you what the answer is. 
Uh, I need to see the development plan for Cheetah 002. Sorry, I don't have the detailed development plan. However, it mentions phase one study conducted by Orion, which is a two parts. It gives us the information it has. Didn't give us the information. We told it not to answer. I don't know if you don't have the answer, which it did, but it gave you a rel relatively uh, appropriate or a reasonable answer. Uh, what are the different phases? In this case, it pulled from both the content and the metadata. So again, what we're finding is that all of these things, the, the, the LLM decided or chose from one uh, piece of information versus another, but those enriched embeddings with the metadata really made a difference. This is the bottom line. This is the kicker, right? Increase of 30 percentage points in terms of accuracy and re recall. So this is amazing, right? That is an incredible increase. Without the, the metadata, with a curated uh, a body of content, uh, we were able to answer those questions more precisely. And again, the IA is really about making that information more uh, organ better organized and structured so that you can retrieve it with the bot. And uh, you know, better question answering, better results, uh, better user experience. Uh, that's that, and I wanted to say, if you scan this, you can get the session slides in electronic version of my book. So why don't you pick up your cameras and go ahead, Giovanni, did yeah. you want to uh, tie this up? So, as I said, I was ultimately the person uh, whose neck was in the news, right? Because I was uh, responsible and ultimately accountable for the, for the, the thing. And so, even with the last minute, uh, uh, I'm, I'm not, Sorry. even no. with, the, with the last minute uh, gyrations of uh, increased access control, et cetera, we deployed the tool. The portfolio review committee me meets and then meets again. And I asked, how did it go? And those were the reactions that I got that ultimately told me that we had achieved a great success. You know that that German lady, the 2,000 hours, the, she, I asked her, so how, how is it going? She smiled. <laughs> she gave me the German smile. <laughs> then. I never saw her smile. <laughs> <laughs> See. That's why I'm telling the story. Highest then, accolade. Half of my team was in Japan, and so I went to Japan and visit with, with my team. And uh, my boss's boss's boss, the one who initiated the entire thing with the email, decided to come and see uh, my boss's team, in including me, and, and have a fireside chat. And I'm like, OK, I'm in Japan. It's going to be at 1 o'clock at night. And my boss said, yeah, it's going to be at 1 o'clock at night. <laughs> said, OK, thank you very much. So I'm there at 1 o'clock at night, Zoom, and everybody else is in a room, minus one, me, in a Zoom meeting. And you know what happens when you're the only one on Zoom, right? You get thoroughly ignored. And so the thing goes between 1 o'clock and 2 o'clock, and at the end, my boss is boss is boss to say, oh, and by the way, Giovanni, sorry, we ignored you. So oh, never mind, uh, never mind. Uh, I can't tell you the name, his name, because I can tell you what industry that was. But he said, hey, and by the way, I am the guy who did uh, the, the, the tool for you. And he said, yeah, so why doesn't he work on my tablet? <laughs> and at that point, I knew that we had a success in our hands. This is not a, a joke in poor taste, because in all my story as a developer of knowledge management system, I know that the worst outcome is when nobody says a thing, because that means that they are not using it. The second best is when they come back with a lot of negative feedback. <laughs> it, uh, the, the best way the, the time where you say, I got a success, is when they come back and they want more. Mm. So if I really had to go, that was a heck of a way to go. Mm. So this is my final act uh, as a knowledge manager. I could have thought of very worse things. I used to finish my chats by saying, if you like to tell my boss, if you didn't like it, uh, let's keep it as a little secret. Now, I don't have a boss, <laughs> and I don't care. So if you didn't like it, too bad. <laughs> Thank you. I, I don't know if we have uh, one minute for questions. Do we have one minute for a question? We have a, a minute. Anybody? Anyone? Anyone? And I'm still leaving that up. Uh, you can also get a business card if you'd like. I know I'm an old-fashioned guy, even read newspapers. What was the question? Um, I I wonder if you're able to share 
what software you used to do the componentization of the documents? Uh, there were some algorithms in, um, uh, I, I don't know the exact name, but we use things like Langchain and a bunch of other libraries. My, if you want to send me a note, I can put you in touch with my uh, architect and he can tell you exactly what we did. But there's lots of libraries uh, to do that sort of stuff. Another quick question? No, stunned into silence? Okay, um, again, feel free to link, reach out to me on LinkedIn. I think I had the LinkedIn uh, thing at the beginning. Uh, I don't know if I can get back to that. But, um, but uh, feel free to give me a call and to touch bases. Uh, nope, that's the uh, copy. Well, I meant to have my LinkedIn thing in there, but I'm just Seth Early at LinkedIn. Uh, so thank you all for your time. It's been a pleasure. And thank you, Giovanni.